Hey, y'all. So this is the second part of my three-part series uh, of my interview and my conversation with Bright Eyes, uh, whom is Sadie's mom. So Sadie, as of the posting of this video, is still missing. Uh, we are still holding out hope. There's just something inside of me, and a lot of other people say that she is alive and still out there somewhere. So until we hear different, still we feel different, Till that's whatever it is that's inside of us that's telling us that she is uh, no longer with us, that we're going to keep looking. And right now, the search is uh, mainly online. And what you're going to hear in this video today is uh, what occurred with Bright Eyes pretty much when the, the day of and for weeks afterwards when... Sadie went missing and when she first posted it on Facebook and how it got to be such a huge thing that was really beyond what she could do in the midst of her being concerned about Sadie, worrying about Sadie, being distraught about Sadie. So it's, it's just, it's really more than, than somebody can bear, uh, in my opinion. So we're going to, I hope you get just a little taste of that. Uh, it would be good if you had watched the, uh, the, the first installment. I'll leave that link uh, right up above here uh, if you'd rather go see that first. And I'll also leave that at the end of this video that you can go and check that out. Uh, but let's go ahead and get back to the conversation I was having with Bright Eyes. But the point is, is that that was kind of when it seemed like all of a sudden... Hmm. everybody started coming together for you not only yep. people that would yep. come in up there yep. but people that online the online presence started yep. really taking on a life of its own absolutely uh yeah. and so it started getting more and more different facebook posts and so yeah. Yeah. um you started a facebook group mm -hmm. i started that later though because i didn't honestly i just didn't have the energy to deal with a lot of this stuff you know, I didn't have the energy to put together a Facebook post. I mean, you got to remember, I was spending like 12 hours a day on actually searching for Sadie on the ground. Right. right. So I only had so much time to put into... Plus you had a bad... So where you are, you don't really have a good signal. Exactly. So Mike had to drive me to signal every day. And I would sit there for like three or four hours a day just responding to text, dealing... I mean, what I didn't... I mean, there's a lot of things I did not know before... I stepped into this situation, but I will say it was an education for me to suddenly be thrust into full-time project management, which is basically what it was. Yeah. You know, over a subject matter I know nothing about. I don't know how to do search and rescue. I don't know how to, you know, uh, coordinate a media response for a, a lost dog or person. I mean, the whole thing was completely new to me. I didn't know how to hire a dog tracker. How, what is the characteristics of a good quality drone operator? You know, there was just so much I didn't know. Um, I didn't know what were the right steps to take. Um, you know, so to be put in this position as like the kind of the figurehead of the group, right? Like everyone was looking to me to say, what should I do? Where should I go? What, what do you need me to do? Um, you know, without and me just not knowing what is the best approach how do i use all these resources Plus you're going are, through the whole mental thing of i'm yeah. missing my, my my baby yeah missing my child yeah it was an emotional crisis that i had to keep kind of pushing aside in order to keep my focus in order to be because if i didn't keep my head about me then all of these resources that came my way would have been wasted resources right, right. like i needed to think really carefully about how to use everyone in the best way possible and so that they felt valued and they didn't feel as though they were being sent on a wild goose chase like that the work that they were doing was important and valuable to the search effort right uh, it was something it really was it was a lot to take on and then you add to that that I'm just completely swamped absolutely swamped with texts and emails and literally four hours a day of just on my phone replying to people because again you're the figurehead right you're the person that everybody is looking to they want they they're they have questions they want answers you know i remember at one point just handing my phone to mike and being like mike can you reply to these hundred texts that i have you know because 
again, people are, you know, they're putting in whatever effort they can, you know, so they're, say they can't come into this area, but they can scroll through all of the missing dog pages of the various humane, mm -hmm. you know, they're sending me photos, and I don't want them to feel as though that effort was um, a wasted effort, you know, right, I want right. to thank them for their effort or for keeping us in in their thoughts you know i didn't want anyone who was helping to feel as though i was taking them for granted so i really wanted to put that effort in but it was just so overwhelming and you know t not to mention i was at mile 30 what, what is it 3200 yeah so you're already wiped out just from the through hike. i mean I, we're coming up to the end and i was feeling happy about it yeah. you know I, I was looking at Sadie and sort of saying, oh, I think we should wrap this thing up, you know. We've been hiking since May 30th, that's when we started. So this was, you know, at that point, close to, what, is that over 10 months? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a lot, that's right, yeah. It's it was 10, a long like time to be on the road, to be hiking, to be putting in that kind of mileage, to be living in a tent, you know, to not have taken enough rest, you know, on the whole, through that whole time, to be, de and this was through the winter, so winter conditions are not easy, you know, they take a lot out of you, so right off the start, I hadn't had it enough zero days, I was exhausted from the through hike, um, it, 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 I truly, it was one of the most overwhelming experiences I've had in my life, and trying to just keep my head about me, um, to keep focus on Sadie, you know, while all this is going on, was it, it was a lot. It has been a lot, for sure. So we had the drones and, and all mm. this. All Now we've got all the people engaged online that are helping yeah. out. Yeah. And then we went the route of getting a dog. Yeah, that's uh, right. A, a dog um, yeah. tracker. A tracker dog. A tracker yeah. dog to track yeah. a dog. Yeah. Um, so tell me about that. How'd that go? I will and be say, honest about it. <laughs> well, I mean, I wish I'd done it. I, uh, you look back on these things and you really wish you'd done things differently. You know, I could only, I could only make the choices that I made based on the information I had, you know. And again, early on, I was thinking... Any day now, she's going to come walking she, Or she's hurt and I need to desperately rescue her because she's not going to survive without water mm -hmm. if she's stuck or hurt. You know, that was really how I was thinking at the beginning. I'll say that... I mean, one intermediary step that we missed here is that there were some sightings during that time period. Oh, we did. So right. a couple. So she yeah. left. She she went missing on the 18th. Yes. And then the 21st or the 20th. The 20th there was, was the first sighting. Was the first sighting. Roaring Fork. Yeah, so. and so that one was interesting because I heard about it in this kind of hearsay way. Mm -hmm. um, someone was sitting at the shelter one day, and she said to me, "I listen there." There's a guy who thinks he saw your dog. He sat here at the shelter for several hours waiting for you. And then he kept going because he had to continue his hike. But he wanted me to send you the message that he thinks he saw Sadie. Um, but he's not sure about it. And this, the person who relayed the message made it sound as though it was kind of like a, well, I'm not sure, but maybe. And I think she said that he wasn't sure she was wearing a pack. Um, he wasn't sure if, it, if the dog was black, you know, so it sounded... That's a real iffy. It sounded super iffy, yeah. and I was so convinced at the time that Sadie was hurt on Walnut Mountain that I listened to it, but I didn't take it super seriously. Um, and then, uh, so, this, so Sadie went missing on Monday. Around Sunday, I got the second sighting report. And that was, this woman came to Lemon Gap to talk to me personally about the sighting. So she was serious about it. Um, she had seen Sadie, she said she had seen Sadie on Max Patch on the 21st. Now, the, the thing about it was that we hadn't publicized really widely at that point. So she said she saw a dog that looked like Sadie wearing a backpack on Max Patch. It didn't appear to have an owner, but it was with a group of people. She was getting pet on by this group of people. Then when she uh, let, like at Max Patch closes at sunset, so everybody who was up there for sunset, they all cleared off the mountain into the parking lot. And that's when she noticed that the dog wasn't there with them. And so she thought, well, that's unusual, that's strange, but she didn't make the connection 
that this was Sadie until she saw the poster like three days later. Okay. So that would, would, would have been Saturday or so that she made the connection. She came to Lemon Gap on Sunday. I think that's the timeline to tell me, look, I'm almost positive this is your dog. Yeah, you know, she showed the photo of Sadie to her friend that was with her and her friend agreed this is almost certainly the dog. She was wearing the lime green. Um, uh, she at the, it, it was some distance away, so she said it looked like a harness to her from that distance, but she said it was definitely lime green, exactly like in the photo. A black dog looked very much like Sadie. And so once I got that report from that woman, I thought back to the first one, the Roaring Fork uh, sighting. And put, you know, that made a lot of sense to me all of a sudden. You know, that Sadie knew for sure that we were going southbound. We've been going southbound for 10 months. So there's no doubt in my mind that if Sadie was going to look for me, she would look for me southbound. Mm -hmm. Then we have a report that Sadie, on the two days after she went missing, that she is spotted four miles southbound. And then the day after that, another two miles southbound. All of that logically made a lot of sense to me. And so at that point, um, we had had the drone search. He cleared the mountain of Sadie. He says she's not on this mountain. If I was a betting man, I would say she's not here. Uh, and so that cleared me up to start expanding the search out to like further south down the trail. Um, but I think at that point it was too late, you know, and that's that's what I would have done differently. I think if I had known would be to split my energy between Walnut Mountain and looking for her further south down the trail. Yeah, but you didn't have all that information about yeah. the sightings and stuff. So, and, and at this yeah. point, you really can't second guess yourself yeah. either. So, yeah. the next thing was we had you hired the dog tracker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, when we hired, I was on the fence about hiring dog trackers because, I mean, one of the things that people don't realize when you go through the situation that I went in is how many scammers there are um, just preying on vulnerable people. Uh, and certainly, if you don't know anything about looking, you know, search and rescue, how to look for a lost dog, I mean, and you're desperate, obviously, I was completely, I still am completely desperate to find her. Um, you know, you're vulnerable to, to these scam artists and you wouldn't believe, I mean, you'd be shocked. You'd be shocked at how many people do and this. And you told me there was some guy that and, wanted to charge you like $3,200 to yeah. bring his dog up there. Yeah, and like the sales, like the high pressure, they'll have like, you know, 20, 30 people in comments and private messages telling you, you know, you're going to kill your dog if you don't hire this person. Yeah. You know, I don't know where, I don't, I don't understand the origins of this industry or who are the people that support them, but. I, I just, my overall feeling was, I don't know how to hire a dog tracker. I'm here, like, meanwhile, I'm getting all these scam messages saying, you know, it's absolutely important, you must do this, your dog's gonna die, her, her life is at stake. You know, I get all these messages and then I'm getting these other messages that are like, listen, there's gonna be a lot of dog scam, like dog tracker scam artists, you know, let me tell you, that you know most of the time it's not it's not legitimate I'm not saying everyone is illegitimate but for the most part they're not legitimate or they're amateurs or they don't really know what they're doing so just be cautious when it comes to hiring animal trackers so I was getting this kind of competing messages coming at me from both sides so one of the things I decided to do at that point was I just got on Google and started researching how do you hire a dog tracker. I mean, this is the kind of thing, right? I had no cell service, yeah, yeah. I had no battery power, and I have to Google how to hire a dog tracker or what is the signs of a legitimate dog tracker. I came across this article um, about a guy who owns a dog who does search and rescue um, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So he's hired by the National Park Service to do search and rescue. I thought, okay, well, there's a legitimate source if I've ever seen one. So I phoned that guy and I was like, listen, do you think we could hire your dog to do search and rescue of my dog, etc." And the message he gave me really surprised me, which was that dogs in general, well, first of all, he said his dog is not trained to search and rescue other dogs. And the reason, like it's trained to search and rescue humans. And the reason that that is, is because it's not natural. This is what he told me. I don't know the truth of this or not, but he's a pretty legitimate source from my point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, it's not natural for dogs to track other dogs. 
this is this isn't something that they do inherently and so if a dog is going to do that they need pretty intensive training they need to, the trainer needs to have worked with them for many years in a very consistent way on this very specific task so they it can be done but you ha it's really buyer beware in terms of who you hire to do this work because um, there's a whole industry of people who are not legitimate, whose dogs are not properly trained um, doing that work. And so, you know, that made me even more cautious, to be honest. Once I heard that from this guy, um, you know, I became even more hesitant. And, uh, and you know, in that situation, I think you have to be, um, you know, you have to be able to make difficult decisions quickly and instead I held back on that decision about hiring a dog tracker for some time. Um, and it was really only once the drone operator cleared out that I think both you and Colors um, kind of put, prodded me a little bit in the direction of um, hiring um, Epic. And I would say like out of every dog tracker in this region, they're probably the one with the best reputation. In fact, when I went to Haywood um, Animal Shelter to chat with them, because uh, I went to all the animal shelters, all the vets in the region, um, they they recommended Epic as well. So I know that on the whole, Michelle and Epic has a decent reputation through the area. Um, and she, so we hired her, thanks to donations, by the way, I should mention this, there's just, I don't even know who these donors are, but I'm, I'm super grateful that just people came out of the woodwork and they, I guess, they gave money to the cause through you. Um, so, you know, I really want to express my thanks for that. Um, yeah, so we were able to hire both the drone operator and the animal tracker because of these donations, or the donations went directly toward those things. Right. I, I didn't personally pocket any donation money. It all went mm -hmm. uh, directly to hire um, the dr these services. Um, so uh, Michelle came out with her uh, dog, Seeker, and the the dog itself, Seeker, was super impressive. I have to say, um, very focused, um, lo loads and loads of energy, um, and um, seemed seemed to really know. If anything, you know, Seeker was a little bit like, "Hey, don't insult my intelligence. Like I know what I'm doing here." <laughs> had a as much bit, as a dog can communicate had a, yeah, that. Yeah, had a little bit of attitude. <laughs> I, I'm good. Yeah, just let me go. Exactly, because Michelle would be like, "Focus," and Seeker was like, "Hey, hey, I'm, you focus. I'm already focused. Exactly, Let's go." Exactly, exactly. That's exactly how I would describe it. Seeker is like very focused on the job. Um, and seemed to be very well trained. I have to say, she said Seeker's been working for seven years um, on dog tracking. And so we brought Seeker to um, Max Patch Road, which is um, on the um, southbound side of Max Patch Mountain, because we had hoped to narrow our search area. Um, and we wanted to cancel out any possibility that Sadie had gone further south of uh, Max Patch. And instead, Seekers smelled every trail, every road, every everything at that intersection. There's several. There's like four or five different potential ways um, that Sadie could have gone at that intersection. And mm -hmm. Seeker just bolted southbound toward Brown Gap. Very, on the trail. Yeah, on the trail. Okay. And so this was, we didn't expect it. Um, we didn't expect that Sadie had gone that far south. And Seeker was just focused, focused, focused on a track really, really intensely um, until about halfway between Max Patch Road and Brown Gap and then uh, wanted to go into the woods, wanted to follow the scent into the woods um, quite badly. And we took a waypoint of that, of that spot and then Michelle kept walking back toward Brown Gap and I didn't realize until later that Seeker had lost the scent at that point. So from that midpoint all the way to Brown Gap. There was no scent. Um, the dog also um, looked at all of the roads at Brown Gap and there's also several, there's one, yeah, there's about five potential ways the seeker could have gone there. Found no scent whatsoever at Brown Gap. Um, so that's what we were left with at that point. Um, then we brought Michelle back about a week later. She had availability and we wanted to again cancel you know cancel out any possibilities we went back to lemon gap there were you know with the thought that maybe sadie had backtracked to try to find me because my smell was all over the trail at that mm -hmm. point so there was nothing at lemon gap 
Then we went to uh, Roaring Fork, not on the trail, but at one of the um, side trails that intersects with Roaring Fork. And there was no scent there. We went up Max Patch Mountain, there was no scent there. Um, at the Max Patch parking lot, there was no scent there. So that second visit, uh, Seeker didn't pick up scent at all in any of those places. So really we were just left with the Brown Gap um, midpoint b between Brown Gap and Max Patch is like our only clue really. Michelle told me later that she like doesn't take her dogs off trail like into it would have involved bushwhacking or going into the woods and so she wasn't willing to maybe she was worried that her dog would get injured or that she herself would get injured I don't know what her reasoning was but that was her personal limitation um, was that she wasn't willing to go off grid or off trail um, uh, with the dog. So that's all we were left with from that, um, the investment in the tracking dogs, unfortunately, yeah. So we were talking about uh, the tracker dog and yeah. I'll probably make my own comments later because you're, <laughs> you're really kind um, and, uh. and, and I, I'm a kind guy too, to a point. Hmm. Um, so anyway, uh, so so then after Michelle came back again, uh, I had actually tried to contact another uh, tracking firm, mm -hmm. and they were out of state. And uh, I sent them an email, and they sent an email back and said, "Okay, go fill out our form." Yeah. Uh, and so I did that, and then and actually there was a day between when they told me to fill out and I didn't so they text me back and said hey have you filled out the form yet so they act mm -hmm. like they were interested yeah. and then but they also knew of uh, epic oh, and so yeah. uh, then I text her then I filled out the form mm -hmm. and I text her back and said hey have uh, did you get the form never heard anything back from them so the day went by mm -hmm. and then again uh, did you get the form and so it was crickets after that so mm -hmm. I don't know if she called epic and talked um, to them and decided that that wasn't she didn't wasn't want to get involved time. but i would have liked yeah. to have gotten a call back from them or, yeah. or a text back from them to see yeah. that so um i'm starting to not that either one of these people are scammers but i'm starting to see where the the industry could be fraught with folks out there like that so it's tough right because she also said that she, you know she's so much in demand and I believe that yeah. there's a lot of people that want these services, right? So they have to decide what's worth their time, what's worth their energy and what's not, you know? Right. And I think that, you know, I asked Michelle if maybe we could come back and take a look at that area in Brown Gap. And she was like, no, straight up. No, Yeah. no, that's a waste of my time. No, you know, uh, she was just, she just didn't feel as though there was enough to work with to be able to, to, to make it worth her time. Well, the, the, the thing where I'm, where I'm having problems with is that she had a hard scent mm -hmm. that it, where Sadie went off the trail. So yeah. why do you not follow that scent? Why do you keep on going down a path that doesn't have a scent? Uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's reasons that it, she doesn't want her to get her dog hurt. You make a good mm -hmm. reason there. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, uh, maybe she doesn't like going in the woods herself. Yeah. Uh, but. When she you, didn't have time either like she she had a different commitment later on that day and so that's where my problems are yeah is that you when you come out to one client you make a commitment to that client if you can't make a commitment to that client then you don't take their money mm -hmm. and you don't come out and if you're not willing to go in the woods because she knows where she's coming it's in the middle of the freaking woods mm -hmm. she's in the wilderness area she's in a national forest so you you know that you're going to be in the woods and that you're not just going to be on the trail so yeah for me i'm thinking her clientele is is Asheville country club being on yards and not being you know anything other than being in the woods and so for that for me i have an issue with that uh and you're too kind to say that but but for me i have an issue with that because she took the fee she should be willing to come out, or at least as a minimum before, she knows where she's going, she should be able to say, hey, I'm only gonna be able to do the trail. Mm -hmm. I don't go off trail, I don't go in the woods, I don't wanna hurt my dog, mm -hmm. I don't like the woods, I'm scared of snakes, yada yada, something like that. But mm -hmm. when you come out in the middle of the wilderness, you have to expect that you're gonna have a, tr a track that's gonna take you off the track, and if you're not mm -hmm. willing to do that, you shouldn't take the job for it. Yeah. It's just my opinion of it. So, so we'll move on. <laughs> Uh, that's enough bashing epic over that, but 
but I, I'll always have issues with that. So mm -hmm. then I guess the, the next thing was what? What was our, where was our, your efforts uh, for that? I mean, we had a lot of people walking um, the actual side, boots the on the ground. Boots on there. the ground, a lot. I I added it all up. It's like well over 120 miles total walking. Um, volunteers between me and, and various volunteers. So that was pretty impressive. And pretty much all those trails and all those back mm -hmm. roads and logging roads got covered yeah. around yeah. the Max Pass Actually, area. Actually, right? I have a screenshot of everything that's been covered. You'd be amazed. Oh, I like I like Yeah, to I'll definitely. That. You can add that to the video. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I don't think that there's any like you know besides just covering everything to the like besides the Apple the trail itself obviously sure. is 21 miles that yeah. we covered that but these are all like you don't even realize it when you're hiking the trail how much there is just immediately to the side right, right? you right. know 100 feet away there's a house or yeah. another 100 feet away like I don't think a lot of people know that there's an absolutely massive complex of public land immediately to the north of the trail between Max Patch and, and what Brown is that, Martha Winquist Martha Sunquist and I just heard the story this morning about how that was made I don't know if like my friends John and Lori told uh -huh. me the story that was they, they were going to turn that into a theme park like a dollywood <laughs> for real this wow. was this land yeah. um had been owned by a paper company mm -hmm. and they decided to sell it and there were all these developers taking a look uh you know interested and it's a huge complex it's like 10 miles by 10 miles public land and you bring up John and Lori, so that yeah. is another huge aspect of this Amazing. that yeah. that you started began fly, putting flyers up everywhere, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that probably started what within two weeks of the disappearance, oh, maybe ten days earlier than earlier that, earlier than that yeah. maybe a week. Yeah, um, after about a week, we started printing flyers and. But you really yeah. started putting up flyers and everything, and yeah. then you met the, all of a sudden the actual, not the Appalachian Trail or the hiker community, but the actual community, the community. up there started yeah. coming around. It was incredible, to be honest. I think that was one of the most beautiful parts of this whole experience was just, you know, this is, I think Appalachia is just one of those things you hear about. You yeah. know, if, I'm a Canadian, I'm not even from here. You know, you hear these little bits and pieces about what life is like in Appalachia and to be able to experience real Tennessee mountain life mm -hmm. from like the real deal salt of the earth mm -hmm. people that was just I, 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 it was one of the best experiences I've had ever in my life, truly. I felt so privileged that they welcomed me in. And you pretty much got adopted by the community <laughs> up there because oh, you know you know yeah. people's names, they know yeah, you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. It's they've true. They've given you places to stay. Yep. Uh, you just had mm. breakfast with them today. I did, yeah. So that is so awesome. Yeah, they're, John and Lori... I mean, they. I had heard about them before I met them. A mm -hmm. lot of people said to me, "If you want to find out, you know, about that," mm -hmm. because I had, I kind of was targeting these specific communities. Like, there's on between Lemon Gap and Max Patch, there are houses on both sides of the trail, mm -hmm. and some of those houses are really close to the trail, like a hundred yards from the mm -hmm. trail. You're gonna have a house, mm -hmm. and so as soon as I realized that Sadie was probably no longer, like we had every hiker knew that Sadie was missing and we had the bubble come through and no sightings, no new sightings. So that really made me think Sadie has moved off of the trail. She's in one of these surrounding communities. So we put a lot of focus into these communities on either side of the trail. But, you know, I was nervous and worried, like, you know, you thought you were going to, everybody uh, had a gun and was shooting and was pointing hey, at hey, you hey, as soon as you walked I am, up. I am Canadian. <laughs> that is how we think about Americans. Uh, you know. Because they don't let y'all have guns in Canada. <laughs> no. That's right. Well, we're, you can have a hunting rifle. But even then, you know, yeah, you need yeah. a license. So that's and not you the need culture there test. like it is here, yeah, particularly I, in southern Appalachia. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I definitely had fear around, you know, what would happen if I walked up the driveway, you know, that kind of thing. It's based mm -hmm. on stereotype, but there's also some truth to it. You know, sure. there and it, over time, I've really in conversations with locals, I've really come to understand why they're like that, mm -hmm. you know. I think it must be really frustrating for them. I've heard a lot of frustration about Max Patch, for instance, and mm -hmm. how it used to be this sweet little gem that they got to enjoy, and someone put it up on Instagram at the in the last 10 years, and now it's a total zoo. Like, yeah. it's, it's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. And they have their children playing on these roads, and people are coming from all over the place, and 
plowing up the roads, at, you know, with crazy speeds, and also bringing in their ATVs and their dirt bikes and making a mess of the public land. And you know, I think my understanding is that they all they ever wanted and all they've ever done for generations going back is live peacefully and quietly on this land. And there's all this encroachment, you know, coming at them from government, from people from outside. Outsiders are purchasing the land next to theirs, and, you know, that kind of thing. And it makes them uh, a little bit guarded. I mean, that's understandable to me. You know, and they, I had the chance to talk to so many locals who expressed that, that they felt, um, that they felt really intruded upon. And this is their tradition, this is how they've lived for, for, for generations and generations going back. This is their family's property. You know, they don't want to be told how to be and what to do. And, yeah. Yeah, so that's where that comes from, I think. Once I talked to them and explained the situation, they were super open. They'd be like, oh, well, why don't you cross my land and go look for your dog in this area? You know, they would all talk to their neighbors. And I really felt that um, with a lot of, uh, I felt the strength of the community of that place and the mm -hmm. pride of place that people took in that area. Definitely, it really came through very strongly. Like their deep love of that land and of the lifestyle that they live up there, and the strength that they find in helping each other. Yeah. So that that's just awesome to hear that story about a, another community that now you've become a part of. There. So <laughs> I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. One. So the latest thing that's happened is, and, and we still haven't been able to vet that out, is that a possible sighting of Sadie at Fontana Dam. Well, so we will leave it in there so we're in digestible hunks uh, that folks can watch that. Um, typically, I would probably let it run longer, but I, I want people to watch the whole video. I want them to get a feel uh, for... Uh, not only who Sadie is, but and what she means to Bright Eyes, but who Bright Eye is. Uh, and, and not only that, but all the people that have been a part of searching uh, for Sadie, as Bright Eyes indicated, uh, pretty much everything that physically can be done there where Sadie disappeared has been done. There's just really nothing much more that can be done there. And so at one thing that has not been done and really the only thing that I can possibly think of is that, you know, Sadie did have an air tag and that air tag has never been pinged. Now, a couple of theories that I have on that is, is that one, it's never been pinged because the person who abducted her threw it away. Another thing is, is that it occurred, the abduction must have occurred pretty quickly after uh, she went missing, you know, within a couple days once the, the person who abducted her got in uh, around other people. And the reason that is, is because uh, that air tag would have pinged off somebody who had an active Bluetooth going. Uh, most hikers and people that get in areas like up at Max Patch where there's no signal, they will go into airplane mode, which turns your Bluetooth off. And then that to conserve battery, they don't turn it back on until they think to get back in a signal area. And really the whole area around Max Patch and particularly leading from Asheville or Newport, Tennessee, that area uh, can have some bad cell service in it. And so people may not have uh, their, cell, their, their cell phones uh, out of airplane mode, certainly around Max Patch there. And, and most hikers, if not all hikers, uh, would do that, would put it in airplane mode. So it makes sense that it may not have been pinged up there at where she had been spotted at Max Patch and around Roaring Fork Shelter. Uh, but uh, and, and even on the trail leading out of there, leading south out of there. But um, you would have thought that when she got to an area where, and, and this is something that has not, wasn't explored in this video because uh, we haven't, um, we, we didn't have that information at the time of this video, but our feeling is that she may possibly have been seen or been abducted by somebody. And that person took her somewhere around the NOC there in Gatlinburg, the outfitters there, or the NOC at Wesser where it crosses the river on the AT, uh, at the Nantahala river. So the reason the, the air tag wouldn't have got pinged around all those people there where they may have had cell service was because it was removed. And somebody that saw that, that was 
nefarious had picked her up for nefarious reasons may have um have done that uh, may have ditched that air tag so the only and i bring that up because the only thing that hadn't been done is to strap a uh to strap a iphone to a drone and fly it around right at treetop level very slowly up there around the walnut mountain match patch area in order to try to ping that that air tag now the the phone may not know that it's ping that air tag but it would send out a ping to uh, bright eyes's phone to let her know it had been pinged that's the only thing that i can think of that hasn't been done uh, and um and and that's a slim chance that 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 would occur or that that would result in anything um, so folks out there if you want to help uh, and we've had a lot of people helping and thank you for all those compassionate folks out there who have done that uh, if you want to help and you're in the area uh, certainly leave a comment on the facebook page uh, to bright eyes and she will direct you and how you can help if you're in the area uh, the, if you're not in the area and even if you are in the area you can go online and look at uh, hiker videos uh, hiker uh, Instagram, Facebook pages, and see if you see uh, a dog in the background that resembles Sadie uh, or YouTube videos. Uh, and then you can also go to uh, Facebook pages and uh, web pages for shelters from Newport, Tennessee, all the way down to Atlanta. Uh, if she was heading south with a hiker and it was somebody who was doing a long section, then they may very well have gone all the way down to the end of the trail there, the term, southern terminus at Springer Mountain or a portion of the way going into Georgia, and they left through Atlanta, and they may have ditched her somewhere, something to that effect. But uh, in any case, uh, please report any sightings of dogs that you think look like uh, uh, Sadie. Uh, Sadie is a female, so if you if it's obvious the dog is, is a male, uh, then there would no be no point in letting anybody know through the Facebook page there that um, that you spotted a dog looks like Sadie because Sadie is a female, uh, and then Sadie it also has a very um, discernible and noticeable um, hump or tumor on her back left hind leg that you can uh, you that is a very very big sign that that may be her of course with all of the other markings that would be her so there's a lot of black labs that have gray muzzles and gray on them out there but there's only one sadie uh and we want to bring her home bring her back to bright eyes so hope to hear from you hope you'll help her out you can either do it through the facebook page where a link is down below uh, search for sadie or uh, you can do it uh, through me. You leave a comment, or uh, I have various links down below in the description section, through Instagram, Facebook, and my email where you can send any information that you would like to send that to. Thanks a lot for uh, helping us, folks, and we look forward to uh, uh, giving you the, uh, the third and last part uh, of our conversation. Thanks a lot. Appreciate you, and we'll see you out here.